Uh, hello everyone. Uh, uh, many thanks to ML organizers of MLDS for inviting me to be here, uh, and also thank uh, thank you all for being here on these uh, on these working days. Uh, I think it takes a lot of effort uh, to basically find time for this, right? Uh, so my name is Manish Gupta. I work as an applied scientist at Microsoft. I also work as a visiting faculty at ISB and IIIT Hyderabad. I also manage this portal MLMinds.com. Okay. The topic for today is uh, deep attention models for NLP. So, uh, you know, it was fun listening to Shaila's talk and, uh, you know, I also do those kinds of uh, very applied and, uh, you know, application oriented talks, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, where he pointed out various uh, difficulties which come up when you're trying to deploy machine learning models in reality, right? So essentially, uh, yes, many of these models are meant for uh, uh, the developed world and when you try to apply for, for our world, they just don't work straight off, right? So essentially, in fact, at Microsoft, we are trying to also deal with the Indian accented English and whatnot, right? So, so not just uh, uh, the infrastructure, but also we are different. We are different from the typical developed world. So that's fine, right? But uh, you know, this talk is is not about applications. Uh, uh, you know, at the end, yes, we'll talk about some applications. In the beginning, I'll start with some applications. But this talk, uh, the core, is supposed to um, you know <coughs> talk about. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, talk about things beyond LSTM, right? Talk about things uh, beyond RNNs and LSTMs. Okay, so so let's get started. Okay, uh, uh, so uh, in fact, you know, uh, this slide was put up to showcase uh, uh, various. What does NLP mean now? Natural language processing, right? So there was a time when natural language processing, all it meant was, uh, you know, take this sentence, uh, take this paragraph, divide into sentences, take this uh, paragraph, find a part of speech tag for every word or do name identity recognition, find out all mentions of person names in this big thousand page book and so on. Right? But now natural language processing means quite some more. Okay? Uh, you know, it means these kinds of things. Uh, and and you know, these kinds of things now have become a benchmark to evaluate how good various natural language processing systems are. Okay? Now again, you know, again, you know, uh, uh, sort of linking to Shaila's talk again, uh, much of natural language processing is still only in English. Yes, it doesn't work for Hindi, Telugu and whatnot. Right, but uh, uh, but but yes, I mean it starts with English because most of the funding is for English, right? So, uh, but the nice point is that yes, we all speak English, so it does make sense to do these things for English, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, what I wanted to point out is that the complexity of these tasks have now increased. The kind of tasks that we care about to be done automatically now. Okay? For example, we now care about asking these questions straight off: Is the sentence grammatically correct? So as to evaluate those GRSs automatically, right? Uh, or, or predict the sentiment of the sentence. Now, clearly, sentiment prediction has not been like a new task, but uh, doing it with much better accuracy is, is, is newer. Right? Uh, given a pair of sentences, are they semantically equivalent? So, you know, to, uh, uh, to, for, for copyright infringement and, uh, you know, to figure out piracy and so on, but not just by, 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 by looking at phrases that occur at other places on the web, but by looking at the semantics, understanding the things, right? Uh, given a pair of Quora questions, are they semantically equivalent? You know, if you have tried posting questions on Quora, you would have realized that Quora says, hey, this question already exists, why don't you refer there, right? And they can do that only because they can figure out that, hey, these two questions are semantically similar. Now, this is not an easy problem. Given a new question, you have to match with like uh, millions of other questions which already exist, and then figure out semantically if they are equivalent or not, right? Given a pair of sentences predicting a similarity score, uh, you know, these are all similarity and paraphrase kind of tasks. And then there are tasks that humans have been really good at doing, but machines have not been good at doing uh, so far, right? Inference tasks, as they are called. So given a premise and a hypothesis, predict whether the premise entails the hypothesis, contradicts, or neither. So you know, if you have a sentence A, sentence B, does B mean the, you know, does, does, is B implied by A or not, right? Now it's a very, very human task. It's very difficult to do it automatically, or was very difficult to do it automatically, like, you know, five to 10 years back. But now it's possible. Okay, now it's possible to a reasonable accuracy that it is deployable. Okay. Uh, given a question and a context sentence, does the context sentence contain the answer? Now this is again very important. Uh, 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 so part of this we did in school manually, right? All of us remember uh, you know, doing this uh, reading comprehension kind of thing. There's a large essay and then you ask a question, find the answer and so on. Now search engines like Bing and Google have to uh, do this regularly. When you ask questions like, uh, when did Jackie Chan die? Right? He didn't, but. If you ask questions of that kind, uh, you know, you need answers straight off from the paragraph, extracted from some paragraph in the world, right? Some paragraph on the web. So how do you extract those answers, right? You can extract those answers by first understanding, does this page contain the answer or not? And then which part, which, which particular sentence contains that answer, okay? 
So that's that. Uh, you know, and, and then entailment or not, uh, or even given a sentence with ambiguous pronouns, and another sentence with ambiguous pronouns replaced by the right right noun, figure out entailment. So, so you know, for example, uh, if we say, uh, uh, you know, Michael told uh, uh, you know Bill that uh, he should, uh, Michael told Bill, uh, you know, that uh, he should not run um, uh, in the elections again, right? Now, what does this he refer to? As humans, we can sort of easily say, easily figure out what, you know, is, it, is it Michael or is it Bill that he refers to, right? And that's called co-reference resolution task, trying to figure out this pronoun refers to what noun in the sentence, right? Uh, but it is very difficult to do uh, for machines, right? And, you know, that is one of those tasks which is now possible. Yeah. So all of these NLP applications, uh, or other, I would call tasks, which are many, many applications in turn, are now possible. And uh, why are they possible now? Because of various models, which I'm going to talk in in the remaining part of the of the of the of the discussion. Right. Okay. So so you know these these entire set of tasks are together called as the glue benchmark. So uh, they are benchmark. People sort of participate. Uh, it's like a hackathon. You know, pa people participate. If you have a better system, sure, submit your solution here, and you know you come at the lead, uh, at the top of the leaderboard if you can. Okay. So that's the idea. Okay. Now, uh, you know, people realize that, hey, these tasks are somewhat easier now. You know, now we have gone past that. So they have become easier, and therefore they define something called a super glue, a newer benchmark, which has even more complicated tasks. Okay? So super glue basically contains, uh, uh, you know, uh, th things like uh, uh, more on co-reference resolution, more of uh, more cognitively difficult tasks to do. Uh, you know, also things like, uh, uh, you know, given a premise, determine either the cause or effect from two possible choices. Uh, and things of that kind, you know, which require much more cognitive thinking and understanding even for humans to do. Okay. So those are the kind of tasks which are now defined in superglue. And again, you can build your own system, submit your systems, participate in the, uh, in the, in the hackathon, and, uh, and win at the leader, at come at the top of the leaderboard. Right. So, uh, and you know, there have been other kinds of tasks, like uh, squared question answering task, which is basically to do with, uh, you know, uh, given this question, what is the answer, right? So who invented penicillin is the question, come up with the answer, okay? Or given this question and a paragraph in context, what is the answer? So usually factoid questions, but also many binary questions, many, uh, many, many questions which require answer as a set or a list and things of that kind, okay? Now, of course, there is also complexity in the kind of questions we can ask or answer, right? So if, if I ask you, is the Prime Minister of India, sure, great, right? But, you know, how many rivers in India are larger than Kaveri, uh, you know? Yes, it requires a lot of thinking, a lot of lookups, right? So, um, you know, it requires figuring out Kaveri is a river and then it is a length, what is the length, figuring out other rivers and then their lengths and so on, right? So it requires quite some cognitive understanding, which is now possible, uh, thanks to now what I'm going to talk about beyond this slide. So this slide, yes, many of you might already know, uh, as Shaila also pointed out, is typical RNNs, LSTMs, right? So, um, uh, recurrent neural networks and long short-term memories, right? So this is the stuff that I teach at ISB, by the way. So this, this particular slide, not beyond this, okay? So uh, because beyond this is, is, is pretty new and requires a lot of basics to understand even this, right? So, so RNNs are recurrent neural networks uh, which can deal with all kinds of sequences. And in this talk particularly, I'm talking about text sequences. It is sequences, uh, uh, you know, they're sentences practically, right? So, uh, or, or there could be other kinds of sequences, like queries in our case in Bing, or, or it could be like questions in case of chatbots and so on. Okay. So it's all sequences, and sequences are best processed using these sequence learning mechanisms like RNNs and LSTMs. Right. So, so they take input at, uh, you know, at different time points and either produce an output at every time point, uh, you know, or, or they produce an output at the end. So for example, if you're doing part of speech tagging, Sure, you want uh, uh, you know, an output for every word. You want to find a part of speech tag, verb, noun, and so on for every word. Well, if you're doing sentiment analysis, you probably just want uh, one output at the end. Right. So that's that. Now, people have proposed other kinds of uh, uh, you know, variants of RNNs also. For example, you know, bi-directional RNNs, so that information transfer happens uh, on, along both directions. Or also deep bi-directional RNNs, where you, know, uh, you no longer just have uh, one layer of RNNs, but multi-layered RNNs, stacked RNNs, as they are also called. Right? And then people said, well, RNNs uh, are, not, are, not, uh, are not complicated enough to, un to, to learn what all humans can learn, and therefore let's, uh, let's have more expressiveness or more complexity in those models, and therefore people propose something called as LSTMs. Okay? 
So NLSTMs are fairly complex, uh, uh, fairly complex in terms of how they take the input and the you know information process so far, so as to generate the next thought or the next kind of information, uh, semantically passed information. Right? But this is the this is where we start, right? Uh, and I still have 20 minutes, so this is where we exactly start. Okay. Um, now you know uh, people said that hey these RNNs are good and in fact they became uh, they, they were the ones uh, uh, in 2012 which sort of started off this field of deep learning uh, in a new spirit. Okay? Deep learning is not a new field it was there since like 1950s or 60s or even earlier. Right? But uh, this is uh, you know like 2012 is when people started realizing that hey we have enough compute power enough data so as to see the improvements thanks to deep learning making a significant impact in business applications. So, uh, so as an extension to RNNs, people propose these things called as encoder-decoder models. Now, uh, they are also RNNs, of course, but they are in two parts, an encoder part and a decoder part. Okay. Uh, the task that people care here is, is a machine translation task. Okay. So you want, to, uh, you want to translate this, I am a student, to uh, its translation here. Okay. So in this particular task, uh, you know, there's an RNN or a LSTM, whatever you like, uh, at the encoder or the input side. You know, and uh, this one, what it does is to really take these words, I am a student. It tries to sort of understand whatever a human can understand. Uh, you know, it tries to semantically extract meaning out of this sentence. Okay. And that meaning is captured in the last layer, in the last, uh, you know, after it has passed all those inputs. Okay. Now, at the, uh, at the right side is the decoder. And the decoder guy, what it does is to sort of try to take that meaning and uh, sort of transform it or express it in a new language. Okay. So, uh, so you know, for example, in this particular case, uh, it generates these three tokens in French. Okay. Now, uh, so machine translation. Uh, so, have you? Uh, so, if you have used, you know, translation mechanisms in the past, like five or six years back, you would realize that hey, they have not been so great. I mean, essentially, uh, the quality was not so good. Okay. But uh, in the past five years, quality has improved significantly thanks to these improvements in deep learning that have come up. Earlier, people used to use phrase translation tables and what people call as statistical MT, statistical machine translation models. But now, thanks to neural networks and deep learning, uh, RNNs, LSTMs, and coder decoder networks, this has become uh, pretty accurate. Okay. So very accurately, you can take an English sentence and come up with, with a French sentence. Okay. Now, but the problem with this encoder decoder kind of models where you take the entire information or the knowledge in English, convert it to some semantics, and then output it in French, the problem is that uh, you need to compress all the necessary information in this sentence into one single vector. And then that vector is the one that drives the entire output. Fixed length vector. Okay. And that vector is not enough. I mean, people realize that, hey, you know, uh, one vector uh, of, say, 100 neurons or 1,000 neurons does not really capture everything. Okay. And that is why people said that, hey, let us sort of uh, come up with this, uh, with this thing called as attentional models. Okay? Now again, you know, all of this is motivated by the way we work. So even uh, you know, if you are asked, take a sentence and translate to another sentence, you don't really uh, you know, read the entire sentence. Uh, of course, you read the entire sentence and then generate the translation. But uh, when generating the translation, uh, for every word that you get at the output, you also process, you, you sort of try to pay attention to particular words in the input. And that is what sort of motivates these attentional models. Okay? So the way these models work uh, is as follows. They basically don't just take the last state of the encoder, but basically they remember the entire history of the states of the encoder. Okay? And what they do at generation, uh, you know, at generation time, at decoder time, is to basically take this vector and compare it uh, with all of those encoder state vectors, and then try to figure out, hey, which all encoder state vectors is this guy similar to? Okay? And that sort of tells them that, hey, which word to pay attention to. Okay. For example, if you take an English sentence, Ram is going to school and try to translate to, you know, Ram Patshala ja raha hai. So when generating Patshala, you know, it's enough to actually just look at school in that senses. Okay. So, so, and that is what they try to do, these models. So they basically, while generating the first token, uh, you know, even the first token, they will try to take the hidden state vector at the decoder side, then compare them with each of those encoder side vectors come up with these similarities and then say that, hey, let me actually come up with a context vector or an or a overall information, which is not just the last vector, but a combined information across all of these four inputs. And then finally say, hey, this is the word that should be generated. Okay? Now, these are called attentional models because these models sort of know uh, in the input what all, uh, what all information should be paid attention to and to what extent, to what degree. 
So, you know, and that is why, uh, and, and people observe that, hey, attentional models are very, very powerful. In fact, uh, they can lead to very good conver uh, con uh, translations. Okay? In fact, they can also uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at, do things of this kind. So if the, if the phrase was European economic area, they can very nicely understand that, hey, this should be sort of written as zone economic European eh, in Frank, French. I mean, you know, there are certain things. So French and English mostly follow the same order, the same, uh, the same word order, but uh, except for some cases, right? And uh, these models very nicely understand that, hey, here is, here is how the order should be changed and so on. So these are all automatic translations that you see here. Right? So that's that. Um, now, people thought that, hey, as humans, we just don't pay attention to uh, individual words in the input, but we are also hierarchical in nature. We think of uh, uh, you know, a sentence as constituting of words, a paragraph being created out of sentences, and so on. Okay. And that is what people did. They basically said that, hey, let's talk about hierarchical attention. Okay. Why just stop at uh, you know, word-level attention? Let's talk about hierarchical attention. You know, I'll first figure out what sentences are important, and how much, and then I'll figure out what words are important. Okay? So, so this is sentiment analysis example, you know, given this particular uh, uh, paragraph or a review, I want to figure out whether it is positive sentiment or negative sentiment. Okay? And what people did was to first figure out, uh, you know, sentence level attention and then say, hey, this particular sentence is probably more important than any other sentence so as to figure out uh, uh, the sentiment of this review. Or similarly, in this particular case, the first and the last seem to be very important sentences uh, to come up with the sentiment value rather than everything else. Okay? And then within this sentence also it turns out delicious or terrible are more important words or am amazing are more important words compared to other words. Okay? So, uh, and, and people have done it for other kinds of tasks also. Okay? So, 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 you know, overall the attention idea has been transformational for NLP. And, and, you know, many, many tasks have, uh, sort of, you know, uh, typically people sort of joke that, hey, ensemble models in general in traditional machine learning give you, you know, 2 to 5% gains over any kind of other classifiers like SVMs or even, uh, or, or, or other, other classifiers, right? The same can be sort of said about attention models. Typically, attention models give you, you know, 2 to 3% gains over non-attentional oriented NLP models. Okay. okay. Now, you know, I'll change gears a little so as to uh, move to NLP 2.0. No, so, you know, what has happened in the past two years now, okay? So, past two years have been super transformational, actually, it turns out, compared to past five years, okay? So, um, you know, uh, earlier when you would ask, hey, what does a particular word mean? You would go back to the dictionary and figure out, hey, this is the meaning of the word. Great, big deal, right? So, search is completely syntactic in nature. If you search for how to make a boat, you will get pages which talk about how to make a boat, okay? But if you want to have semantic search, how to make a ship should also match how to make a boat, okay? Uh, unless some of you are marine engineers, but you know, uh, so, so for most of us, ship and boat are the same. So how do you do this semantic matching? To do that matching, uh, you have to come up with uh, some sort of dictionaries which can give you synonyms also, great. Yes, boat and ship possibly are synonyms in Mariam Webster's dictionary, okay? But uh, you know, Virat and Sachin are also synonyms, somewhat, right. somewhat. So now who will establish that is the question. So how do you figure out these synonyms which can't be find, found, found in English dictionaries? Okay. So as to do that, people thought that, hey, let's use this neural network kind of uh, framework so as to uh, understand words. Okay. Uh, and the neural networks all work on numbers and therefore they started coming up with these embeddings, so-called embeddings, a vector representation, a numeric representation for every word, uh, uh, an array of numbers. And that's when they came up with, uh, you know, these kinds of things, word to vec. So for king, there's a number, queen, there's a number. And if you have read the word to vec paper or heard from somewhere, you would have heard this thing, king minus man plus woman is a queen. And, you know, word to vec nicely, nicely also showcases that. Okay. Well, the problem with word to vec uh, is that, uh, you know, natural language, NLP, is, is, uh, is, is natural. So it has all those intricacies which can't be captured even with word to vec. Okay. So for example, when you're saying open a bank account versus on the river bank, Bank is not the same, you mean two different things, although you use the same word, it's so funny, right? I mean, you use the same word to mean two different things, okay? But in different contexts, right? Because we have context, okay? So therefore, people said that, hey, let's train context-sensitive embeddings. So let's make neural networks also understand that, hey, you know, words don't have meanings by themselves alone, but they also have meanings captured by the context, okay? And therefore, people started thinking about contextual embeddings. So uh, now, bank here would have a different embedding from the bank there. Now, it turns out uh, that uh, uh, in the past two years, significant work is done on learning these contextual embeddings really, really well. 
And if you can learn these meanings of words better, you can do everything in NLP, everything in natural language processing much better. Okay? And uh, that is what you know, the remaining part of the presentation talks about, that hey, people have proposed these things called ELMO, you know, which look like they contain LSTMs and so on, but yes, arranged in a particular order so as to give you context-sensitive sen embeddings. Okay? Uh, <coughs> now, uh, almost two years back uh, came a very awesome paper called as Transformers, you know, rightly named Transformers. Okay? It really transformed the field of NLP. So, uh, transformers uh, are, uh, are gigantic models, very large models, very large neural network models, okay? uh, which, which are not recurrent at all. So, compared to LSTMs and RMNs, uh, uh, they do not have any kind of recurrence in them. So, recurrence meaning, you know, sequential connections in those senses. Okay? Uh, but they process information very, very deeply. So, in the sense, uh, while typical RMNs and LSTMs can only be stacked like 2 or 3, you know, uh, depth of 2 or 3, these guys actually have a depth of 12, and the larger one, the, the big boss has a depth of 24. Okay? So, and these transformer models, when the paper came out, of course there are technical details shall skip here, right? but when the paper came out, these guys basically showed that they can do awesome things. Okay? For example, <coughs> you know, uh, they can actually do co-reference resolution also in a context sensitive way. So if the, if, the, if the sentence is the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, well, it refers to the animal. Okay? But if the sentence is the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide, it refers to the street. And these guys were actually able to capture such kind of intricacies which humans can do you know, very easily. Uh, again, I mean, uh, you know, first standard could also, could also do that, but we all know how bad automated NLP is, right? So, so compared to that, this, this is a significant thing that, hey, you can actually now uh, figure out it refers to animal or street depending on the context. And then over time, uh, many, many big brothers of this, uh, of this transformer network came in. So in the sense, uh, you know, uh, some models called as GPT, uh, followed by uh, something called as BERT. BERT, you might have heard about BERT, because a lot, of, a lot, lot is written about BERT in, in that sense, right? Lots of blogs and lots of tutorials and so on now. Okay? But BERT is not old. BERT basically came out in 2000, 2018. Okay? It's, just, it's just like, uh, yeah, it's 2020 now, but I could practically say it's last year. So, um, and uh, uh, BERT, uh, it depended on transformer networks and, uh, you know, it has its own way of training and so on, but uh, again, it is the one that sort of uh, uh, basically led to these leaderboards called glue and super glue. Okay? When BERT came in, people thought that, hey, NLP is now in a very flourishing stage. So now you can actually do complicated tasks and people will not laugh at your output. People will be like, wow, you know, a machine can actually do this. Okay? So, uh, so, so, you know, uh, so, so that's, when, that's what BERT did. Okay? Um, in, in fact, uh, at Microsoft, we use BERT in many, many products now. So, of course, there are trans, uh, you know, challenges with respect to deployment. So, essentially, how do you deploy these large models? These models are pretty large. In fact, uh, I think BERT is about, uh, yeah, BERT is about 340 MB in size. So, yes, when you think about uh, putting out an app on your mobile phone, you have to be careful. Uh, and there are ways of doing that as well. But, uh, you know, when it comes to servers, uh, where we can do uh, nice uh, query to document matching and things of that kind on, on large RAM servers, 340 MB is nothing. So, we have deployed BERT across multiple applications. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you know, as I said, BERT basically, uh, you know, beat down all, all scoreboards. In fact, you know, the uh, question answering scoreboard or various kinds of scoreboards, multiple papers came up saying that, hey, I use BERT to basically, you know, come up with a better accuracy for this task and so on. Now, uh, after BERT, other models came up, like GPT-2, um, you know, uh, from various other companies. Of course, there are companies also fighting with each other, trying to come up, showcase, uh, you know, especially after the leaderboard, people have been like, hey, can I showcase, uh, can I come up with a better model which can beat other models on standardized benchmark data, okay? Uh, so BERT, uh, Transformer Excel, and so on. Uh, in fact, uh, the last guy, uh, the Transformer Excel guy, actually said that, hey, RNNs, LSTMs, were all recurrent in nature. Now, transformers and BERT and GPT basically said, hey, no recurrence is required, only depth is required, fine, you know, but attention is required, right? Uh, and then what these transformer Excel guys said, hey, let's combine the two, you know, let's basically have recurrence, let's have attention, let's have really significant depth as well. Okay? And uh, that's when, you know, they basically said they proposed transformer Excel and the network uh, on top of that called as ExcelNet. Okay? <coughs> so, um, yeah, so you know, uh, these kinds of things uh, are trained by actually, uh, uh, you know, by, by actually making it learn things of this kind as you see here. 
So uh, I like cats more than dogs. So what is done is that the network is shown the entire sentence. One word is hidden. Okay? And then the network is asked to sort of fill in the missing word. That's how these are trained. And ExcelNet was also trained in a similar way using something called as a permutation language model, which sort of gave it uh, really good strength. Uh, okay, so then again, Microsoft came up with their own MTDNN model, multitask, deep neural network model, and so on. So I will, uh, yeah, um, many such models came in in the last two years. This has been going on very, very fast. Okay, very, very fast. In fact, uh, in uh, you know, this one was specifically important. Uh, this is actually almost like August 2019. So Albert, people started worrying now. Okay, business guys basically said, "Great, you are improving the accuracy." But uh, you know, one of the guys in Microsoft, uh, he basically said, uh, one of the CPs, right? Great that you're coming with better accuracy. And I'm happy that consumers are now getting their outputs with 5% better accuracy. But you know what? Every time these guys do a query, my GPU, you know, my GPU is clocking its bill. So essentially, are we getting enough money from the consumers to justify the amount that has to be invested into deploying these models? Okay? So the idea is the cost per user of uh, serving them the product uh, started increasing with these complicated models. Okay? And that is why people came up with this thing called Albert, a light BERT. They said BERT is too large, let's try to make it small without losing on, efficient, without losing on accuracy. Okay? So, so, so now you know, Albert is one of those models, you know, it's 1.7x faster, 18x fewer parameters, smaller sized model, fewer parameters means 18 times smaller, but gives you still almost the same accuracy as BERT would give you. So that's that. Uh, and then you know, latest, October 2019, uh, Google came up with this T5 model. Uh, again, a very large model, you know, uh, a very, very large model, 11 billion parameter model. It's, it's 26, 27 GB model, very large model. Okay? Not deployable really, but yes, accuracy wise, it gives you much better accuracy uh, than compared to just BERT. Okay? In fact, you know, this is more or less where I'm going to end uh, very soon. Okay? Uh, yeah, this is the leaderboard now, okay? glue leaderboard. Okay? Uh, remember I talked about those awesome nine tasks in the first slide? Okay? Those tasks are the ones which are evaluated by the leaderboard okay? automatically across multiple teams who submit their, uh, their things. Okay? Uh, now at the top, as I told you, it's T5, which basically, uh, you know, which, which came like just three months back. Okay? Uh, and it has a score of 89.7. Uh, if you look at human baseline, you know, when humans actually solve these tasks, their, their, their performance was 87.1. So already, you know, machine learning systems have 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 bet human baselines. Okay, have already outperformed human uh, a human. Okay, but that doesn't mean that hey, you know, uh, things that are simple can surely be done by a by a neural network. You will find that sometimes neural networks, you know, end up in mistakes uh, which you will think like, hey, my two-year-old kid can also do this. Okay, but the idea is on average across so many complex tasks, uh, we have already outperformed human baselines. And in fact, you know, since glue was so easy, people came up with uh, another one called super glue. And this is the leaderboard for super glue. Okay? Uh, so again, uh, yeah, uh, still two minutes, no problem. So you know, super glue baselines, human baseline is 89.8. So super glue tasks are more complex, as we said, right? 89.8. Uh, this is human. You know, somebody frames questions and somebody else solves them. Uh, some humans, right? Uh, versus you know, T5. And if you look at it, it's not really very far. I mean, it's it's almost there. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm hoping for yet another baseline, yeah, yet another such leaderboard coming up sometime soon. Okay? And these leaderboards are, by the way, managed by, by uh, you know, globally. They are not like, uh, you know, a Hyderabad leaderboard or something of that sort. People from all across institutes, academic as well as industry institutes, significant, uh, participate in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, by spending insane amount of dollars in trading these models and so on. OK, so lastly, you know, I will just talk about a very recent deployment of one of these models that we did at Microsoft in a product called as Microsoft QA Maker. The product is very simple. Uh, you know, what it does, if you own a website, it takes FAQ pages from your website and creates a chatbot for you. you know. So the idea is that if you owned, a, let's say, ICICI a website, right, then you can basically, uh, you know, there are, of course, like, probably if you go to ICICI, there are like 10 to 20 FAQ pages on ICICI, depending on what product you are browsing and so on. If you want to build a website, uh, build a chatbot on ICICI, all they need to do is give the URLs to those 10 to 20 FAQ pages, give it to QA Maker, it'll extract question answer pairs, and then nicely answer natural language queries based on that. For example, you can say, uh, you know, hello, how can, you, uh, how can I help you? Yes, whatever the user says, uh, it can actually understand whatever the user said. Now, of course, there are many, many chatbot pl platforms online, right? I mean, Rasa, uh, Dialogflow, whatnot. 
But uh, the idea uh, around this one is that it can semantically very nicely understand. It's not patterns based. You don't need to feed patterns that, hey, uh, a question of this kind can be asked. It's a very free-flowing thing. You can ask whatever kind of question you like. Okay? It'll do a highly semantic match to the database of question-answer pairs and come up with the answer. Okay? Again, we used uh, you know, a deep uh, transformer-based networks just to solve this, this problem. Okay? okay, so this is my takeaways. Time is up. And uh, you know, here are the takeaways. Uh, Transfer learning is very useful in NLP tasks. Context-sensitive word embeddings uh, are clearly better than word to vec uh, You know, uh, attention is important. Uh, you know, attentional models in that sense is. Larger models trained with large infrastructure seems to be giving better results as of now. And uh, human parity has already been achieved uh, by many of those uh, on many of those NLP tasks, uh, and the field is growing fast. So, you know, so so if you are looking for uh, you know investing your time into reading up something more, this is what it is. Okay, so that's all. I'll stop here, and uh, you know, again, time is up. But I'll probably take, uh, I can, I can probably take questions later, so as to avoid any, uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm going to be hanging around here for about half an hour. Uh, so, but I'll stop here. Thank you.